Welcome to Must See Monday. Thank you all for joining us. It's great to see you all here. Um, my name is Rebecca Blatt. I'm Senior Associate Dean at the Cronkite School, and it's my pleasure to welcome you and our guests for tonight. Um, I am joined by Manny Garcia, who's Senior Editor for the ProPublica Texas Tribune Investigative Initiative. And prior to that, he served as Standards Editor for USA Today Network, um, and formerly was an editor uh, at the Naples Daily News and edi editor and general manager of the Span Spanish language El Nuevo Herald. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Manny. And uh, also joined by Fernanda Santos, who many of you may know um, as the Southwest Borderlands Initiative Professor of Practice at the Cronkite School. She teaches narrative writing and bilingual reporting. And she came to us after 12 years at the New York Times, including five as the Phoenix Bureau Chief. She's also the award-winning author of The Fire Line, the story of the granite mountain hotshots. Um, and we may ask her about that a bit later. Um, and I welcome all of the students who are joining us and I'm eager to hear your questions on this topic. So um, please do uh, share them in the chat and I will um, get to them as soon as we can. Um, and I should say also, we were supposed to be joined tonight by Susan Smith Richardson, um, who is not feeling well tonight and is not able to join us. Um, but she's, she's of course disappointed not to be able to come and we'll find another time for her to get to talk with students. So um, she's terrific and, and I look forward to introducing her to you another time. Um, but the title of tonight's discussion is Objectivity, Trust in the Future of Journalism. Um, there's a lot to unpack there in just a few words there. Um, so I want to just start with the, the notion of objectivity. Um, this is something that has, you know, comes up a lot in journalism, but especially in the past few months has really been a topic of, of a great deal of discussion at the Crown Kate School um, and in the industry. Um, Fernanda, can you start us off maybe your approach to this notion of objectivity and whether you see that even as, as something that we should be striving for um, uh, in this you know, particular moment? Uh, well, first of all, it's great to be here. Hello, everybody. I saw a bunch of names that I recognize. And um, well, you know, um, I, I moved to this country in 98 and got my first job as a reporter in 1999. And from my days in graduate school, um, uh, which is the reason that brought me here, uh, I've been hearing about objectivity. And I think that we're now living at a time, and I feel very comfortable saying that, where um, this notion of objectivity almost seems like it's outdated. You know, it's just not, the, in my opinion, the best word to describe what journalists should strive for. Um, I always tell my students, um, I say whenever I speak about journalism, that it's truly fairness what we're looking for. And I think in part because to me, at the very least, the idea of objectivity was always communicated as leave your feelings, your emotions, your opinions behind, just bring yourself an empty slate and face everything, deal with everything with no, no influence by where you stand. And I think that that's very dangerous because the most important thing, in my opinion, is to acknowledge your biases, to then be able to police them as you report. So fairness is what I talk about often, is if you're being fair to, um, to the people you're speaking with and being fair to the story and even being fair to yourself by not letting these distractions take you in different directions, um, then your report will be, um, will be, in my opinion, a quality report and will say what it needs to say. Manny, how about you? You were a standards editor at USA Today Network. Um, yep. how, how did you approach this then or, or since then? Yeah, so for the students, uh, thanks for the invite. I'm really happy to be here with you all. First of all, let me say it, you're at the, uh, one of the crowning jewels of journalism at the Cronkite School. So congratulations to all of you who are there. It's, I've, I've been there. Uh, I've had colleagues who've worked there. I've recruited from there. It's just, it's a wonderful institution. So congratulations to you all. What I want to tell you Ed, during my time at USA Today as standards editor, uh, the number one thing I heard from readers, it was accuracy. They wanted accuracy. Uh, they wanted what they perceived to be in their view fairness, that we were fair and fair to people. And uh, that uh, in their view that uh, 
they, they did use the word objectivity. Hey, you're not objective. You're, you're opinionating. You're, you're, you're opinionated. So again, what I would say to you all is as you're doing your reporting, above all, uh, accuracy. If you're not accuracy, it's if you're not accurate, your organization will suffer in the long run. Are you being fair? For example, if you have to write about someone, are you giving them ample time to respond? And are you trying to trying uh, to make sure that they have their voice in in the story? And again, it's and it all flows from that. They just really being finding a way to be accurate above all and bring context. Look at your reporting and make sure that you're looking at the context that you're spelling out uh, the different areas that everything has nuance and explanation to it. And that really I'll, I'll share is uh, what I heard the most. And now in my current job at, uh, at ProPublica, again, sacrosanct above all is we have to be accurate and we want to be fair to the individuals that, that we are writing about and that we bring context to the reporting. Uh, because that's something that readers really want. There's a thirst out there, uh, students, for just help me understand what's going on right now. Because there's so much noise pouring in. So they're looking for that beacon. Think about a lighthouse, the reason the lighthouse exists. So they're looking to us to be the lighthouse to provide them with an explanation why things are. I wanna um, challenge though a bit, which is if we're um, focusing of course on accuracy and fairness, and I think those are, I think you've hit the nail on the head with those terms. Um, to what extent is there a limit about how much of our own opinion or um, personal perspective would we either include in our reporting or share publicly but outside of our professional work. Um, do you see limits to the extent to which we should be doing that? Um, Fernanda, you want to jump in? You know, I think that um, I believe very firmly that there that it's very um, beneficial to journalism and to journalists to report from the perspectives that they have to incorporate the way they see the world, the vantage point that they, they've had, the, the past experiences they've lived, because that's what makes the report so, so rich and so varied, right? If everybody strives to leave all of that behind and then write the story from that, um, you know, that, that, that blank slate perch where, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, <clears throat> what you've lived in life, uh, and, and then all the stories are going to sound pretty much the same. And, and this context that Manny talked about many, many times come exactly from the fact that um, I am including some of my sens the sensitivities that I have gathered over time in the way that I report so that I am able to not only um, allow myself to see things in the way that I see the world outside of my time as a journalist, although I, I think I'm a journalist all the time, but, you know, um, but uh, in addition to that, I am able to approach the way others see the world and, and what they tell me about the way they see the world with curiosity. Um, one of the biggest mistakes is to believe that there is one perspective that ought to be the one that we all should strive for. Um, maybe, you know, for years, uh, I think, uh, at least I can speak from, from experience, there was this belief that, you know, my perspective didn't matter as much. Uh, and this effort to, to try to uh, see things through the eyes of those who were in leadership positions in the news organizations I worked for, um, without realizing that a lot of these people were um, uh, Caucasian, uh, male, and of course I'm not Caucasian, I'm not male, so why not bring in what I have to frame my story? That of course doesn't mean that I will only write about people who are like me, or every time I write about people who are like me, it doesn't matter what they did, they're always going to come out on top. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is simply providing your reader, it's like a camera, right? You're, you have these different points of view, 
providing a reader a way into a story that is informed by who you are. And I, I firmly believe that this is one of the greatest uh, 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 tools that any journalism any journalist um, uh, has and and should employ in um, in the way they go about doing their work. Sorry, Manny, what about outside of your sort of work hours, if you will, um, to what extent have you advised the newsrooms and reporters you've worked with um, to share publicly, you know, things outside of their professional work? Well, you have to, one of the things to be mindful of as journalists, when you work for a news organization, you represent that organization. And so that's something that doesn't uh, close off when, when at the end of the day, you are the ambassador for your organization and you want to be able to, uh, that doesn't mean uh, you're a robot and you lose the persona you are. But at the same time, you are you were you represent an organization and its values, and it's in your value systems are, are are part of that, too. So the reason I I offer that perspective because know that what's what oftentimes happens not oftentimes what will happen is when you're working for, uh, whether it's a television station, radio, newspaper, nonprofit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you work, you will be backgrounded. Stay, rest assured that uh, if it hasn't happened to you already, that you will be backgrounded. Your your Twitter feed will be looked at, and the, what folks are going to be looking at is for their view what they feel is bias, anything that stands out, anything that uh, possibly can be used against you to just damage your testimony as a journalist. So what I what I tell journalists is like. Be very careful, especially students, what you're posting, what you're saying. You don't want to be an automaton, but also but be very mindful that this is, you're building your brand of, of who you are. So what, what, I, what I've told individuals, in fact, that <clears throat> USA Today, and it'd be worth it if she hasn't talked to you already, uh, the former editor of the Republican, Nicole Carroll, who was my boss, uh, we always remember come election day or when there was a hot button issue, we would have to send, I created a guide for, listen, be careful what you're posting on there. And because individuals got into trouble for some of the things that they posted on, on Twitter and so forth. So always remember that you want to represent your organization in a, prof in a professional manner because it's also, it's a reflection on you. Sorry, Fernanda, do you think that um, the way that newsrooms approach this idea of objectivity or sort of trying to remove bias from, you know, your persona or your reporting, do you think that's changing? I feel like we're hearing a lot more nuance recently in conversations about this. And I'm curious whether you think um, in your experience there, there is real change happening in newsrooms right now. First, I think that the idea that uh, there was a time when stories or that there are certain reporters were able to write very unbiased kind of stories is not something I believe in because just the very approach to the story shows a bias, right? Not a bias in the negative uh, sense of the word, but it shows that you're choosing to approach that story from that perspective because you found in you, through your reporting, uh, through the knowledge that you have, whether it be, you know, as you reported that story or things that you brought with you, uh, that this is the most compelling way to get to the real point of the story. Many times it's a character whom you choose to, to be sort of like that guide of, to the reader, to your audience, right? A, as you uh, really get to the point that you want to drive home, um, uh, the bigger picture of the story. So I think once we accept that, then the conversation ought to be, well, um, why is my perspective biased and somebody else perspectives not consider uh, biased um, and and then it's the it's it's really at the heart of a lot of the discussions we're having these days is who should be the one dictating what it means to be biased and not biased right um, I I think that there are um, uh, certain types of biases that or certain types of perspectives that for example, I have never been afraid of, of talking about, I am an immigrant and I have that on my Twitter bio. Um, you know, I, uh, 
Um, I tweet in Spanish and English and Portuguese. And, you know, if you don't like that, well, you can move on and go to somebody else or you can troll me and bring lots of people who will be interested in that and they will follow me, you know. Uh, but I completely agree with what Manny said, which is that there is this like fine line that has always existed, but I think now it's it's a more nuanced line. We're more aware of the different perspectives that come in and we're more respectful of people who say, okay, well, it is biased to you, but um, it's not necessarily biased to me because it represents the perspective of an entire community that has been uh, ignored for quite some time or overlooked for quite some time, right? So I think it's more what's happening now as from where I, uh, the way I look at it is that there's almost like a redefinition of this idea of bias and an acknowledgement that, you know, um, whose bias were we uh, uh, using as the guide to determine who is biased and not biased. <laughs> I hope it makes sense. <laughs> yeah, sure. Manny, um, from where you sit, do you think that the, the conversation or expectations are shifting? Well, they have to. There is no choice because uh, healthy newsrooms are ones that are striving to build a level of diversity. And I always use the example, I've always used the example that iron sharpens iron. And you don't want to have a newsroom full of individuals who all think alike came from the same schools. And so think about this. That's it's that it's your life experience shapes who you are. And so as you begin your careers, one of the questions to ask is, as you're trying to get hired and look at the uh, look at the value system of an organization, uh, look at the masthead, look at the editors, and for what you're looking for is a diversity in, in, in talent and individuals, because that's what breathes life into a newsroom. And just look at everybody who's on this call, just uh, like Fernanda, I'm an immigrant. Listen, I, I come from Cuba, where there is no First Amendment. You only have one political party. So the reality is, for folks like Fernanda and I, you know, we're living the American dream. We're in, we're in a, in a democracy, <clears throat> which is really in, in, a, in a battle right now, but it's still a democracy. But to your point, uh, the biggest, what's the reckoning that's happening now is there is a realization that you can't survive unless you're building newsrooms that really reflect your community because the, the readers are demanding and the audiences of yours, they're demanding respect. And, they're, and you no longer have the monopoly of the printed daily newspaper or the broadcast or the radio station. There's all sources. So that's forcing, it's also forcing the change in the business model that you have to operate that way. It's probably a little bit heady, but that's, that's what I've seen as a great success. The newsrooms that are much more diverse are the ones that are really succeeding and, and they're the ones who are going to grow market share and ultimately overcome everything. And if I can add a quick thing to that, Manny, I think that, you know, with the, during the election of uh, President Trump, that, that's a, a good example uh, when we think about the lack of th this one um, uh, perspective that has reigned the, the coverage, right? So many people were so surprised. Um, and when we talk about diversity, it's not just people from other countries, people of different races and ethnicities. It's also people from rural America, from, you know, large cities, from inner cities, although I don't like the term, but, you know, um, um, it's, it's people who are, uh, um, LGBTQ plus, you know, it's people who uh, may have been raised by a single parent, um, people who have just different perspectives and circumstances to help translate the moments we're living in, because we're always living in a moment, you know, this is the COVID moment, but there's always something going on. And while certain groups of people may look at it and be very surprised by what happened, others may have looked at it and said, you know, you really should pay attention because this is going to happen. Um, and there are many, many examples that we can bring up uh, about that. But it, there's this uh, over time, over the years, um, the sort of northeastern, you know, New York, Washington perspective of how things, how the the country works, has been the dominant perspective. When in fact, to the northeast is very 
unique. It's its own place, just like the Southwest is its own place, you know? So, so this idea of having different perspectives only help us better become better translators of the times we're living in to then present the news and also incorporate in our coverage the people who often feel uh, left out, not just people of color, but also the extremes, um, you know, and, uh, and and maybe even get to a point when, when you know, maybe sounds very Pollyannish, but, you know, um, to a point where we can um, uh, counter the attacks on the mainstream media by, by, um, by incorporating greater perspectives into the daily report that we have. You know, Rebecca, let me weigh in real quick for, this isn't for your students. So in 2016, when Clinton and Trump were in the throes of the race, there was a belief, we saw the polls, it's Hillary's going to be president. Uh, I was, I had just started with the USA Today, my, before I became standards editor, I was a regional editor. And I remember being up there on election night, but even in the weeks or just re before the election, uh, we were on a call with editors in the Midwest, I want to say in Ohio, Wisconsin, and so forth. And, and there was a group of us who were saying, please stop running these polls. Trump is going to win here. They're, they're wrong. You can't trust them. We're looking foolish. And it was that Trump was going to win these states in the Midwest and that the polls were wrong. Trump was going to win Florida no matter what and that it was very likely that Trump was going to win the White House. But that was a disconnect to what you were seeing. And so to Fernanda's point is you get to that when you're reporting on these communities and you're treating the, the, those who live there with the respect and listening to them. So and when I became the uh, regional editor, I, I went through Ohio and you really captured and understood by being on the ground and talking to uh, families why Trump was going to win and was winning. So one of the suggestions I have for many journalists on, on this, uh, on budding journalists on this call is uh, don't be afraid and I encourage you to start your career in smaller newsrooms that are not big cities because it is, it is gold. Uh, even though I may have started at the, I, I interned at the Boston Globe and I started at the Herald, I started at the Miami Herald in the community sections, which is in the suburbs twice a week. It was a weekly, but covering communities that weren't the city of Miami downtown really opened my eyes. So I suggest this is a great way of building your toolkit by covering underserved communities. Go sign. <laughs> Fernanda, um, can you talk a bit about that too? There's a, a question about, you know, when you're a new reporter in a new area or covering a new community, um, how you get to know that community and build trust with that community. Um, can you talk a bit about how you've done that? Yeah, you know, I think that um, I, I grew up with a father who um, would always say, just listen, listen before you talk. And I think that was a great lesson when I became a journalist because we sometimes believe in, and I tell people, all my students all the time that the relationship between a journalist, a reporter and their sources, they, a lot of times a reporter goes in thinking that he or she is in a position of superiority, right? I am, in, I have the power, but the reality is that your sources have the power because if they don't want to talk to you, you have no story. Therefore, they have the power to open up to you or not. So, uh, of course, at some point, that balance kind of starts shifting, right? And then you have all the information, and then there's that moment of fear. They're like, oh, my gosh, what are you going to do with all of this? Um, which then goes back to being fair, being accurate, builds that trust. But how do you first get to know these people? It's a great question. You know, show up. There's a lot these days that people think you can be you can do by calling someone or emailing, um, to interviewing them on the phone. No, show up, introduce yourself in person. I am here at your community meeting, and I came here to listen. And I know it's difficult because newsrooms are so so. Um, uh, uh, st st they're just so hungry. Um, um, 
starved. That's the word I'm looking for. So starved for resources, right? So they want to send you out to the meeting to go and cover something, which is fine. Be smart, find a story, get a story, cover it, but give your business cards to people. Make a point to start your day a little earlier. Stop by a store, stop by a community center, you know, stop by the, uh, the drop off at school and talk to the teachers where they're ushering the students in. Of course, in these times, it's, it's a little more complicated, but it's not impossible. And these times are not going to be forever, right? So you have to be comfortable doing that. You have to be comfortable ap approaching strangers, introducing yourself and not say, I am here to do a story about this. Ask the question, what are the stories that you would like covered? What are the things that you would like to see in the paper? What do you think of the way we cover your community? And you might get an earful, but it's not about you. They're not aiming that at you, you know? Um, they will appreciate the fact that you listen to them. And then you can say, okay, well, I always would say that. Okay, they would say the media, this journalist that I say, okay, I am Fernanda Santos. Can you give me a chance and talk to me? If I mess it up, then you know, cross me off your book, don't talk to me anymore, forget about me, and, and I'll just have proven your point. But please give me a chance. And I would say the nine times out of 10, people are willing to give you a chance. But listen, learn to listen. <laughs> Manny, can you. You, can you add sort of a perspective of how like an organization builds trust? Fernanda did such a beautiful job talking about an individual um, and you know, you, you've had some editing, you know, sort of larger roles that look at the yeah. whole community or a whole region. Well, listen to what Fernanda said also, Fernanda's presentation, she was very humble saying, it's not about me. <laughs> and she, you know, so you have, she doesn't make it about herself. Give her, give me a chance because to tell your story. So that's, that's very important. All right. So let's, let's talk of, uh, about an organization where the organization builds trust, I mentioned it earlier, you have to be accurate. Uh, there is, that is just, that is the most non-negotiable fact in our profession. And you have to strive every day that your stories are accurate. Uh, we're editing right now uh, an investigation by that three of our reporters are on a ProPublica. They're, they're, they're doing a fact, they've got 700 points in the story that they're fact checking, at least 700 that they're going through right now uh, as we speak. So it's accuracy. It's also transparency. When you make a mistake, to acknowledge that you make a mistake and explain why you, you erred. Uh, it also is in attribution that rather than, unless you've got an opinion columnist, but in your daily work, that you attribute what you're writing. Readers ask a lot about that. that well, I didn't see attribution. You made this blanket statement. Uh, our audiences are a lot more sophisticated than we want to give them credit for, and they look for that. Uh, the next point is what I call ambassadorship. And it's harder in the time of COVID because the traditional beat reporter, uh, before journalism, I was actually, I was in sales for 10 years. Believe it or not, I sold beauty. I sold beauty supplies, and I drove. I, I drove a friggin' truck, and but I, I don't have any hair. But I sure knew how to sell beauty supplies. But one thing I learned from that job is in sales, if you're out of sight, you're out of mind. How many of you have been somewhere and suddenly you run into somebody and they go, "Oh my gosh, I'm so happy I ran into you." I had to tell you that. So you have to be seen as a beat reporter. It's credibility. It's important to be seen. In the time of COVID, it's going to be harder. So the way you do it, if you're covering a beat, is stay in contact, use Zoom, mm -hmm. use Microsoft Teams, call people, uh, text them, just, it's better to be seen. So use Zoom it whatever way, but the way an organization builds that, it's all those uh, put together. And it's also covering, it's also covering your community in a way that uh, we have to be watchdogs and expose what's being done wrong, but also you want to celebrate successes. Uh, I worked for a great publisher when I was in Naples named Bill Barker. And in fact, talk about accuracy. Bill would walk in the newsroom in the morning and says, are we being accurate today? And, yes, sir. Yes, we are. Okay, carry on. 
<laughs> but he also talked about strengthening communities. Our job is to strengthen communities. And he meant that twofold. Are we celebrating the good that folks are doing, celebrating covering the high school football game, the athlete and so forth, but also are we being watchdogs on how the school district is dealing with using our tax dollars? Is City Hall uh, spending properly and you know, if they're gonna raise our taxes, why? And so it's, it's that balance, but it's, and it's, and it's every day. So you have to think of your newsroom and your news organization like a breathing, living, breathing uh, operation. You know, we've got heartbeats and, uh, and we breathe. So it's a tough task, but that's, that's the way you do it. And if I, if I can add a, a, a quick thing um, to all of this is that I, my first job in this country was in, uh, I covered the communities of Wilbraham and Hamden in Leicester, Massachusetts. And if you've never heard of them, uh, you're not alone. Um, but one thing that I, I, I remember very vividly, there was a board of selectmen, which is like the town council. Uh, New England has this very unique uh, government, um, a style of government or uh, government structure. And um, I would go, you know, every Monday night to sit at the board of selectmen meeting, look at the agenda. And I, it, and those things seem so small to me. I came, I grew up in Rio de Janeiro in Salvador, which is the third largest city in Brazil. And then I moved to Rio, the second largest city in Brazil. I come from, you know, I lived, I've traveled the world, you know, I, and then I get to this tiny little town and all the things that made people so upset or, or led to these long labor discussions seemed so ridiculously small to me. And at first I resisted them, but then I said, you know what, maybe this is the news. Everything that seems small to me is probably what's really relevant to them, what really matters. And that was sort of like this moment of realization where I stopped resisting the fact that I was covering a small community and accepting that and then taking everything that he talked about and being really curious about it. So why does why are there so many dog hearings? Why do people have hearings over barking dogs? I mean, really, is that what government is for? And guess what? In small towns, it is what government is part of what it's for. And there are incredible stories of how communities come together and are torn apart by these things. And when I was at the Times, I remember going to Elephant Butte, New Mexico, to do a story about a dog named Blue, who was a, an, a stray dog in Elephant Butte, and the neighboring town of Truth or Consequence enacted a leash law and uh, uh, because a pit bull had attacked somebody. So there was this big uproar in the tiny little town of Elephant Butte over what to do with Blue, because Blue was the town's dog. He was everybody's dog and nobody's dog. So do you leash the dog? But then who's responsible for leashing the dog? And it seemed that my editor at first was like, why? Why are you going to do this story? And I said, because it's ultimately a story about community, you know, and it's any community anywhere where we relate, can relate to that in one way or another. And I think that it, it was slated for the front page of the Times and there was some Russian poet or somebody who died and it was bumped off the front page. But that's how much of a big deal, like they realized at that moment, they're like, yeah, you know, this is a part of the country that we sell our papers, therefore we should cover them too in a more sophisticated way, of course, because it's the New York Times and you got to bring in the big sense of community and all that stuff that the Times does. But but at the heart, it was a story that I was trained to do by covering the tiny towns of Wilbur Hammond and Hammond and Western Mass. Um, Fernanda, you talk about coming to you know, your work with a sense of curiosity um, and I'm wondering how you do that when you're interviewing someone who has a view that is so contrary to the way that you see the world or that may feel wrong or unfair um, based on your life experience. How do you, how do you come with a, a sense of you know, open-minded curiosity when something someone believes is, is offensive or emotional to you? Well, same way that what they believe in is maybe offensive or, or seemingly wrong to me, I, I would assume that the, what I believe in and how I see the world is probably offensive and seemingly wrong to them, right? So, uh, so that's a good place to start in my head. Okay, you know, they don't agree. I don't agree with them. I think they're abhorrent. I would never have this person as a friend 
Yet, uh, this person may well think the same about me. Therefore, let me uh, approach this with a sense of, uh, as a learning opportunity. Tell me something about your world that will make me see it in a way that's different. And I, there have been times in certain, in, in some circumstances where I was talking to people, you know, like white supremacists. One of my first stories in Arizona was um, involved a white supremacist. And, you know, you sit down with that person, I would never excuse him. And he, it was very clear that we had very different beliefs. But I told him, it got to a point, he, we were arguing. And it got to a point that I said, okay, tell me something about your world that I don't know. Tell me something in a way that I have not heard it before, or that I haven't seen. What is it that I'm missing here? And I'm not saying this to just say that, and then he told me that, and I wrote this story that revealed to the world that he's actually was a good person. No, because I genuinely believe he was a bad person. I think racism is wrong. I think judging people who are different and being violent to them is wrong. But it allowed me at the very least to continue that interview without having that wall in front of me that would have prevented me from seeing the details and capturing the nuance that maybe would, that, that hopefully helped paint a more, um, uh, a fuller picture of that person to my reader because I am there in front of this person. I had three hours talking to him and I had, you know, a thousand words in the New York Times. Uh, it's very hard to, to, you know, put three hours, pack three hours into a thousand words, but it's, it's um, going to be a much better thousand words if during those three hours I allowed myself, even in the moment of hating being there with that person, to capture some of that nuance and put it out there for people to see and also explain to that person you know i really don't agree with you and you know I t but i want to be cha challenge me sometimes i will say that challenge me tell me something i obviously this is an extreme situation but sometimes it helps to say tell me something i don't know about your world about the way you live uh it, you know i'm not looking for you to change my mind but tell me something that would reveal something about your life and your world that uh, you would like people to know about. Um, and sometimes it opens up a, a way of uh, into the conversation that would have been very different if I just came with my prepared list of questions and in my preconceived notions that I hate that person and don't agree with them. And, you know, I'm just going to write a bad story about this person anyway. And, um, you know, we have to be open to these things. We have to be able to go to prison and interview people who are convicted of horrible murders, um, but may have been abused. And ProPublica has done a lot of work on that um, because one bad thing doesn't justify another bad thing, right? Like you have to be able to navigate these worlds to get to the actual story that you're trying to tell. I hope this makes sense. It made in my head. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Manny, is there anything you wanna add about how you approach reporting on topics or with people who, um, you know, are, see the world very differently than you do? Sure. Uh, I, you always, again, I go into treating everyone with fairness, dignity, and respect, whether I agree with them or not. And I'll, and I'll give you, I like, I'm very proud of saying this. Uh, two of my best sources remain today are people that I help send to prison. And why? Because during their worst, worst moments, uh, I treated them with fairness, dignity, and respect. I gave them time to respond. They were committing crimes, and no doubt, but uh, I gave them their side of the story. They weren't sandbagged. Uh, there was no surprises when they picked up the paper, and uh, they, they read their stories. And then after the story ran, I called them because I don't believe in hit and runs and wanted to talk to them. And and they ended up going to prison. And when they got out, I talked to them. And so I don't have to agree. And I did, again, I may disagree with folks and you, you, our job is to challenge individuals. And in this case, I remember writing about uh, <clears throat> a police chief turned city manager in Miami uh, who was basically stealing from a children's charity called what? Do the right thing, <laughs> true story. <laughs> And uh, when we went to confront them with, we just show them, this is what we have. <clears throat> and he went on, the, on, on a full attack against us. And, you know, he had been, our own editorial pages when I was in Miami treated him like, you know, called me like a white knight. But, you know, 
I have yet to meet one individual who has been bad and are 100% bad. Uh, people have slivers of decency. And I, and I knew in this case, and not in every case, that doesn't mean I'm going to throw them the towel, but uh, I know that their family members and children will be reading it. So there's collateral impact to these stories. But my view is that I'm going to present my facts, just be professional in my approach and treat them fairly and, uh, and, and move on. Uh, fast forward to my job at, uh, at the USA Today as standards editor, individuals would call me, curse me out, wish that I was uh, dead and you know, your family, you're a piece of crap. Why are you in this country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, some hung up on you. Funny because they would, they, would, they would curse you out, leave messages on your phone, not knowing that your number was, that they had a number was captured. So I'd call them up, I'd say, yeah, you curse me out. And then it wasn't me, it's yeah, listen to your voice. <laughs> then they'd hang up. Others would say, well, I was, I was drinking, I apologize. And, but listen, the, the point is that uh, no matter who you're covering, uh, they could be the worst person. And I've, I've covered police, I've covered great police officers and I've covered police officers who lied. And in fact, in one case, uh, police officers who basically helped frame a guy who ended up doing, was serving life in prison for uh, murders and the rape he didn't commit. And so imagine having to send them letters and talk to them and they're saying, why are you defending this guy? He should rot. Well, that, that gentleman we wrote about, his name is Jerry Frank Townsend and Jerry Frank Townsend is now free after doing 22 years for a murder and rape he didn't do, he was doing life. So again, uh, the last piece of advice I'll tell you in this, in this landscape is uh, don't lose your cool uh, in this because uh, oftentimes you'll be talking to individuals or somebody will try to trip you up and get you to lose your temper or explode or say something. And when that happens is, or you'll, you'll be attacked personally. Remember this too, and I, I tell you this as someone who's been doing this for a long time, when they attack you personally it is because they can't attack your reporting. Mm -hmm. So remember that. But when they attack you personally, they go after you is because they want to get you off the story or get you off the beat. So always maintain your cool and uh, speak to your editors or a trusted colleague if you're at wit's end with an individual or seek, seek help, help from one of your colleagues. Um, we have a question from Dylan Bes uh, Pescatori. Um, when your boss says a story should be written one way uh, and you disagree, um, how, how do you handle that? How do you advocate for you know, something that you want to include or a different way of looking at something or, or approaching a story? Well, the first thing I would do to myself, with myself, let's assume that I'm that reporter and I've been there, is say, okay, no to self, start looking for another job. Uh, <laughs> because I, I think that one of the greatest mistakes that editors can make is write the story in their heads without trusting the reporter who's on the ground doing the reporting. If you were the one out there, you were the one who talked to people, you were the one who went to the scene, you were the one who did the research, you, are, you should be the, the person with the best, um, uh, best and most, uh, 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 the, the best amount of information um, to, um, to suggest uh, how that story should be approached. But editors exist because, good editors exist because they have this great experience and understanding of the news cycle and understanding of how the politics of the newsroom operates and understanding of what makes a front page story, what you need to get to get there. So it's okay if the editor is telling you, you know, um, go back and get some more on this perspective. You know, you, you were, you weigh too heavily on one side, but there's very little from the other side. And this other side is the one that's most interesting. Be open to that kind of edit. Um, but if, if you turn in a story, you went to a meeting and you, you're, you, let's say you go to a press conference to announce, um, you know, the opening of a, um, 
uh, a homeless shelter for senior citizens. Um, and you come back and the editor says, no, that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is how there are so many senior citizens on the streets. Well, how about talk about both? But really, this is important piece of news that is happening right now in the community. Ha be able to, to be able to have that conversation with your editor, I think, is very important. And what many said when it comes to dealing with sources who we, are, we don't agree with, keeping your cool is very important. And having a relationship with your editor is very important. Uh, you don't show up. You know, I was never one to show up at work every day and just go to my desk and turn on my computer. I... I am just that way. I talk to people. I say hi. I stop by their desks. You know, sometimes I annoyed my editor because maybe I talked to him too much. But I genuinely was always very interested in having conversation. And what happened when I was doing stories that the editor might have thought should have been written differently, I would say, you know, I hear your point. Now, let me tell you why I wrote this way. And here are my arguments. And sometimes, uh, many times we would find sort of like a way of adjusting the story that conformed with what the editor wanted, which it, which was not so much a complete rewrite or a fake story. It was always um, more information about something that I neglected to consider heavily in my reporting. Um, or I would say, you know what, uh, you're right. Um, uh, or so the editor would say, you know what, you're right. But I do want you to follow up on that and go work on this other angle tomorrow because I think that that's really important too. Um, so I guess, you know, it boils down to having a good relationship with your editor. Don't be afraid to say, to ask why. Why do you think it should be different? Why do you disagree with me? Why did you uh, take this whole entire part out of this story? What was it that, um, what is it that the story is missing? Why is it that you want it to be uh, not what it is? Uh, ask the questions, especially if you're new, because that's how you learn ask the editors uh, to explain their decisions or their thought process to you. And, um, and I think that um, a lot of times, especially in the world of words, uh, written word, um, it's just a matter of airing things out and, and finding a common point than uh, scrapping a story altogether and replacing it by something with something that somebody uh, wants you to write about that isn't true. I never worked for somebody who asked me to write something that wasn't true or who asked me to write something that was clearly biased because they didn't like the way I wrote. Um, even though I resisted some of the edits at first, um, when I took a deep breath and went back to my desk and um, sat down in front of my computer and looked at the story, I could see that the editor had a point. And I'm not saying they're right all the time, but you know, they, they make a lot of good points. That's the reason why they're editors. <laughs> um, yeah. I want to throw out a, oh, go ahead, Manny. No, listen, uh, Dylan, that's an excellent question. And there's actually uh, a, a one day lecture to be done on that. <laughs> because the reality is when you go into your career, you may be a, you may be a night general assignment reporter and the former publisher calls and says, you know, my neighbor just passed away and this is the name of the funeral home. She was really nice. I, a nice obit would be worth it. And then you look the person up in the clip. They've never been out there. That doesn't mean that they would be a good story. So there's oftentimes, or like the Chamber of Commerce is trying to push some kind of story. Ah, oh, this is a good story. It's good for the community. And, uh, and we, 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 sh we should write about this. And sorry, kid, you're the new kid on the block, so you got to write it. Welcome to the newsroom. So there's different levels of what, maybe it's, it's which, you know, what battle do you want to fight? And so there's certain stories now, for example, to, to Fernanda's point, you don't want to be in a place for a long time where, for example, they're covering things up and they tell you, listen, we don't want to write him, write about uh, this. In fact, I, I, will, I will share with you that uh, it's worth having Jerry Mitchell, who runs the Center for Investigative Reporting in Mississippi, uh, talk to you guys. Besides, uh, he's solved civil rights killings that the Justice Department knew in many instances who the killer was. But he, he had a recent example where a reporter was told not to write about something in one of the Mississippi communities. And so that reporter passed it on to Jerry and Jerry ended up working with the reporter for another publication on it. 
So these things happen, luckily less so. So you have to battle, you know, okay, this is a nice chamber story. It's I'll just write it and move on to the real story I'm trying to do. So it's what I say is pick your battles. Now, as far as writing to your point on your question, the boss says the story should be this way. And so a, a, a secure editor, you, you can have a conversation and say, based on my reporting, this is what I think the lead is. This is why. But don't just say, well, I think it should be written this way. State your case. Your editor may say, I, it needs to be written like this and in the story. Well, you know, there, that's called pulling rank on you. So there is, in, welcome to the world of journalism, and this will happen. Or the worst one will be when you get the call from the editor. You know, I was in a shower this morning. I was thinking, this I think would be a really great story. Don't you agree? Oh, I hate those. <laughs> and you're there holding your head going, no, boss, I don't think it's a good story. No, no, come on, let's try it. And then you're thinking, who can you assign it to? So welcome to the world of newsrooms and human nature. But the reality is the large share of editors out there, you can have that conversation and give and take, but that also comes with building a trusted relationship with your editor where you build, learn to trust your editor. Your editor learns to trust you, especially when you're newer. That's going to come through accuracy, attribution, solid reporting. So it's, it's a great question. And we can talk about it into Friday. There are so many different iterations of that idea, right? Of the editor telling you to write a story that's not the story you wrote. There are many, many different circumstances. So yeah, I agree, Manny. It should be like a, a day-long seminar on that. I think we should do it. I would love that. I think that would be, I think there, there would be a lot of entertaining stories to go around. Um, I want to throw out one more question. Um, and I, there are two from uh, Stefano Contreras, and I might try to sort of pull these together. So um, I'll read the first. Um, Canadian journalist Candace Callison and Mary Lynn Young argue that, quote, journalism, despite its claims to objectivity and being outside both culture and the social mores of its time, actually participates in propping up social order and preserving the status quo. To what extent do you agree with this argument? Um, and I think at a time when, you know, we, we obviously try to um, be those watchdogs and hold government accountable and people in power accountable. Um, it's a good question to ask to what extent are we involved in um, the power structures that we're having so many conversations about right now and, and what is our role in, in propping that up, so to speak, or, or not? There was a, I was uh, watching today um, a, a clip from uh, Professor uh, Len Downey, who was a uh, long time, um, he spent his entire career, is still with the Washington Post, but uh, executive editor of the Post has a book coming out um, tomorrow. Um, and he said this to um, Brian Stelter on uh, Reliable Sources on Sunday. He said, the, the, he was talking about political coverage today, right? The problem is that, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing him, the issue is that reporters are spending too much time covering Trump and his allies and not enough time covering the truth. Uh, writing about what is true. Um, and I think that um, to the extent that um, uh, journalists can uh, be act, uh, trans can, can spark transformation, can spark change, um, uh, you know, let me rephrase this. A journalist's ability to spark transformation, to spark change comes from the uh, the intent, the very specific intention in reporting the truth. And, and putting the truth out there and holding uh, people in power, holding their feet to the fire, you know, making them accountable for what they say, for what they do or don't do, for the actions they take or don't take. And by people in power, I don't mean just, you know, the presidents or the, uh, uh, you know, Congress people in Washington or anything like that. You know, uh, your neighborhood association is somebody in power. Anybody who has a decision factor, who has the power to make decisions that affects the lives of others. Um, and so, you know, I, 
I never saw, I have never seen myself and I don't believe in journalism as being, uh, what was it, outside of the culture uh, or whatever the quote was, right? I think we are the part of the culture and that's why we exist. We are immersed in that culture and we report it out and we present different perspectives on it. Um, and uh, I don't, don't think at all that we prop up the, the status quo. I think that um, the best reporting and ProPublica is an excellent example of that. Uh, is the reporting that um, uh, goes after the truth, puts it out there, and then goes back at people and say, so what's your reaction to this? What are you going to do about it? How are we going to, to change this? Um, you know, there is a reason why during the pandemic, there has been, have been so many stories talking about, for example, the fact that parents with children who are, who, have, who are doing online schooling and who are working parents are really scrambling to get out. Well, there comes a point when, you know, the pressure becomes such, or at least that's what we hope as journalists, that some type of, uh, uh, it's going to be addressed somehow, whether it be by your employer, by the government, I mean, not necessarily, you know, by somebody. So I am a firm believer that we don't prop up status quo that we challenge the status quo when it needs to be challenged and we seek uh the types of changes that are necessary to make the world uh, a more equitable equitable place for for everybody yeah i uh so at, at pro publica without a doubt you know we report you know with moral force say that now and what i'll tell you is and as in some newsrooms, uh, the status quo has been propped up and protected. Funny, Fernanda, you were mentioning Len Downey. I immediately thought of Len Downey because in, in the Washington world of reporting, I shouldn't just pick on Washington. In many areas, the reason this is propped up or protected is because it's, it's the fear of losing access. Mm -hmm. And so if you look, the reason I thought about Len Downey is if you look at the, the number of individuals who are off the record or on background in stories related to the Beltway in Washington, D.C., it's the stuff that your professors and just, and, and I would not tolerate the amount of um, background sources on stories when it's really needless to be but it's it does happen i've worked in newsrooms where you've had publishers and editors and who who like going to the events and like being seen and because they would be with the politicians and the school board members and the district attorneys and and the and the big law firms who would whisper tips in their ears and it and, and it, it it in essence you know, you slowly become co-opted. So what you want to do is uh, uh, focus, again, this goes into where you go to work. That doesn't mean that you don't go to work in a place where you can basically explode and, and detonate and, and sink the status quo. I've, I've worked in newsrooms, I've seen newsrooms where they went, where we went in there and just <clears throat> blew things up hired new people and got things changed for, for the better. And so again, it's just, from my standpoint is, is as you continue your job search, look for organizations that really like to challenge authority, you know, hold people, hold, you, you, you wanna be a muckraker in essence. But what, what it comes back to for me is just, our job is to hold the powerful accountable and to speak with the voiceless. I work with a I work with a journalist a long time ago, and if there are any of you who have covered the police departments, that's really difficult to penetrate police departments. And we had a police reporter in Miami named Joan Fleischman, and Joan told me early on when I went in to cover the cop shop, she says, "Don't worry about pissing one cup off," because in fact I wrote it down. When Joan, what Joan talked about, is that what you want to be, you want to be respected respected you want to be known for being accurate fair and you don't hit and run and if you hit that cop hard you write about that cop but if you've been fair and accurate <clears throat> and that cop decides never to talk to you again 
trust me, you're going to get 50 sources because you wrote about the sacred cow that, that would brag that I have the publisher, I have that editor, and I have them on speed dial. When I mentioned to you all earlier about the police chief named turned city manager who was stealing from the children's charity, he was such an individual. He had the ear of the editorial board. He was a, in a person in a position of power who would whisper, I have so-and-so on speed dial. So imagine when we took him on, reporting on him, our editorial board was writing about how great he was. So that's about this, this whole issue. Was, so it exists, you know, where you're protecting the social order. But to Fernanda's point, a large share of news organization, they're independent. They operate with their job being that hold the, hold the feet of the powerful accountable. I'm mindful of the time, but I just wanted to ask you each one to comment on one final thing, which is, um, you know, this this conversation ultimately is talking about how we can move journalism forward and move our communities forward looking ahead. Um, and to sort of wrap it up, I'm wondering if each of you could share something that makes you excited or inspired or hopeful about the future of journalism now. My gosh, it's going to sound really cheesy, but honestly, my students inspire me every day. I come to, and I am coming to school to teach. Um, some are home, uh, some are in class, but we have these great conversations. And um, I find that the perspective, I'm 47 years old, so I learn so much about what it's like to be in your early 20s right now. And, and then we talk about experiences that are not the same, but that are connected and related between what I lived through when I was in my 20s, what they're living through, how they're experiencing it versus how I experience, how my 11-year-old daughter experiences. And one thing that I notice about today's generation that really like, and I say today's generation based on, you know, the great students we have uh, that have come through my classes is um, that um, they're incredibly compassionate. This idea that it's not about them, you know, that, that there is a greater purpose to how they want to do things. And there is this desire to, to, to live in a, in a place that's, that's more, um, fair and and equitable and uh, and and nice, you know, not in a not in a, a wussy way. Is that an allowed word? I'm sorry, but like you know, not in like cry baby kind of way, but in a uh, in in a true like you know, we can be just better individuals. We can do better than that. We can be better than that. And and how can I use the journalism that I'm learning here um, to exercise that, you know? Uh, and, and that gives me so much hope. I don't know if I was that hopeful in my 20s. I don't know if I had reason to even worry so much about the world in my 20s because maybe I wasn't as connected to the world as, as my students are today. Um, but every day I leave school and I'm feeling like, gosh, you know, I, I, just learn so much about life and I want to be do better tomorrow so that I can continue to empower them. You know, uh, I don't know how you feel, man. You deal with um, yeah. all sorts of journalists on all ages. <laughs> yeah. So look, I've, I've been, a, I've been a recruiter. I've, I've, I've done everything. So what, what I'll tell you now is what I see. I, I want you to, I, I want you all to operate with your eyes open, see what's happening now in our country. Uh, what's happening with our elections process, with what you're hearing from the president, how we're divided and so forth. And uh, I've, I've had led teams who've covered Cuba, Venezuela, Colombia. And I see a lot of, I was just talking about it with our uh, former managing editor of Nuevo Herald about some of the similarities we've seen recently or in the last couple of years between what the president's actions have been and uh, as critical as he's been on Venezuela, he's also taken, made some decisions, some actions that are very similar to what you've seen in country. And I say that I don't have a dog in a fight politically. For me, it's just, I just want the best for the country that gave me and my family a chance, really, because I'm living the American dream. But what I see from the students today, this is your time. Uh, Another little ditty um, from Manny, my Mannyisms. 
So I can, I'm probably going to claim that I'm the only Cuban to have covered the National Hockey League. <laughs> I, I, I covered hockey. And I got sent to Montreal to cover an all-star game uh, a long time ago. And I went into the locker room of the Montreal Canadiens. And they have a poem there. And it's from Flanders Fields. It's a World War I poem. And it says, from failing hands, we pass the torch to you. I'm paraphrasing, but from failing hands, I pass the torch to you. Be yours to carry it high. So look, I, I have a great career. I've achieved a lot. My job now is to develop servant leadership, develop you all. The, the baton is being patched, passed to you now. And what I see from you all, this generation of journalists, this is you have great hearts. You have great spirits. I wrote this down. You can cut through the bullshit very easily. And you have great souls. And so what it's important on you is go into this fight with confidence and security and go make this world better. Because it's not Pollyannish because what Fernandez says, it's important. Your job now is more important than ever. And I think, frankly, it's the best job there is because we help change laws, right wrongs, and we don't have subpoena power, which makes it even better because folks can issue a subpoena and get people to talk to you. Like Fernanda said, no one has to talk to us. So last thing I'll tell you, because I'm in Texas, if you've seen Friday Night Lights, remember this, clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. Go get them. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you, um, everyone, for joining us and for sharing your great questions. We could talk about this for hours more, but in the interest of time, I hope you all have a great night, and um, thank you so much for the conversation. Send me your resumes. <laughs> they will. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all.